So awesome. Looks like we have about 59 participants right now. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, I want to begin by thanking all of you for joining us for this webinar, uh, which was supposed to be a pre-conference, of course, at RSA in Portland. But uh, instead, my um, co-collaborators uh, uh, agreed to uh, provide this in this format. Uh, so we hope it's a productive conversation. And I'm uh, Karma Chavez. I am the chair of the Department of Mexican American and Latino Latino Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. And um, I uh, will introduce my other panelists in just a moment. I want to uh, make sure to thank our sponsors, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign Center for Writing Studies and the Department of Communication. Uh, and also just to note that we are recording the session. Again, we are recording the session, but only uh, the panelists are gonna be visible um, and um, throughout. Uh, and so uh, you also, and during the Q&A portion, you'll have the option to, you could submit questions uh, anonymously as well. So hopefully you all see the Q&A uh, button at the bottom. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're each going to give about five to 10 minutes of presentation. And uh, then we're going to just open it up to, to questions and get through as many of them as we possibly can uh, over the course of our hour together. So um, with that, having that said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce our two panelists who will go in the order that I introduced them. So our first panelist is Dr. Tamika L. Carey, an associate professor of English at the University of Virginia. An interdisciplinary scholar, Dr. Carey's primary field is rhetoric and composition, and her specific research and teaching focuses on African American rhetorics and literacies, feminist rhetorics, Black women's writing in intellectual traditions, and the memoir. Uh, she is the author of Rhetorical Healing, The Re-Education of Contemporary Black Womanhood, which came out from SUNY Press in 2016 and is a feminist critique of Black women's self-help and wellness culture. And then our second speaker will be uh, Dr. Andre Johnson, Associate Professor of Rhetoric and Media Studies in the Department of Communication and Film at the University of Memphis. He's currently collecting the edited works and editing the works of AME Church Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, which a lot of you have been following on Facebook, if you follow Andre on Facebook. <laughs> uh, and he's also the co-author of The Struggle Over Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter, which some of you hopefully heard about uh, the other week on the first of these RSA seminars. Uh, that book won the 2018 NCA African American Communication and Culture Division Outstanding Book Award. Uh, so these are my uh, very esteemed <laughs> colleagues who I'm excited to learn from. And um, Tamika, I'm going to turn it over to you first. Okay, um, Karma, were you able to, I hope, can, can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, Karma, were you able to get a slide that I sent to you? Yeah, let me just get this pulled up here. Okay, well, as Karma is um, getting that pulled up, I will kind of discuss why this topic is of such interest to me. I went to my graduate program very green. I was first generation everything. I did not really understand what a life commitment, life altering commitment it would be to pursue a PhD eight hours away from family. I wasn't sure exactly how long the process would take or how um, little control I would have over the job market. I thought I could just run up to Syracuse for three or four years and come right back to Virginia. And so um, I wanted to give that context, but um, the remarks, uh, okay. Well, I'm trying to get permission to share my screen here. Ah, we do need that. Hopefully you had that. Um, the remarks that I wanted to share today um, are drawn from both best practices that I've observed and problematic um, practices that I have witnessed and encountered. I'm not sure if my screen is stuck is. Okay, so we're back. Um, again, I am speaking from both uh, best practices and uh, some of the things that I've 
witnessed. I found a lot of resonance with the original call for last year's or 2020 RSA on hospitality. And so I thought that I would kind of talk my way through a couple of bullet points about um, this imperative to be hospitable that I think uh, conscious graduate programs, communication studies and English departments would be wise to lean into. So if you could uh, project me one slide over. Perfect. So um, this is a lot because I struggle with scope. <laughs> but um, I'm going to start with some of the things that I think went really, really well with my initial recruiting visit. And at my graduate program at the time, there was a two day event that um, the program would host every March at the beginning of March to give graduate students kind of a bird's eye view of the program. And there were a couple of things that I found so comforting that have resonated with me throughout my career about that event. The first, as I said, is a first gen uh, scholar of color who came out of an MA program where there was no formalized discussion of what we would do after we completed our master's thesis. I walked into the graduate office on the first morning of um, visiting days, as we called it, and saw another scholar that had also gotten her MA in the name program, a woman of color. And then there was another scholar there, a Puerto Rican um, scholar, researcher, who have become lifelong friends. And so from that, I took uh, that one of the things that a program can do to kind of practice or at least signal to scholars of color that they are intentional about being hospitable is outreach and recruiting multiple mm -hmm. candidates of color. I think we've read so many narratives about the one uh, scholar of color who finds their way into a graduate program, how that singular experience can kind of foster imposter syndrome and all of these other negative consequences. And so just walking in and seeing these two women was so comforting to me. Um, a second thing that I found, and I'll, I'll say that this is kind of an offshoot of that commitment, an obvious commitment on behalf of the graduate committee that year, and perhaps a pool that allowed them to do that, is um, that scholars, or better said, departments would be wise to start building in a clear identifiable focus into the architecture of their curriculum that makes space for scholarship and research by and about people of color. Um, again, I came in a, with a cohort. There was another woman of color. I was very happy that I was not alone, but I've noticed time and time again, not just in my program, but elsewhere, that the, scholar of, the scholarship of people of color gets relegated to electives, to the margins, et cetera. And I'm thinking about what it would mean if in your introduction to scholarship course, there is a reading by a scholar of color, a book, a project that formalizes that space from the beginning, the role and the emphasis on recognizing that research. Something else done really well during my visit is that one of our uh, faculty members took us off campus to a space in the community where he was running a course. Um, I, I don't think that it needs to be a secret that uh, this was Adam Bakes's very well-known community course. And he took us to the place where he was running that course for a dinner during my recruiting visit. And while I sat there and ate my chicken wings and met the people in the Syracuse <laughs> community, I started to see this is a place where I could have a home, a life beyond what I would be doing in my scholarship. It's just one place that I found. But for me, it was such a forward thinking gesture. It signaled that at least those people on the committee knew we're not gonna be scholars 24 hours a day. 
we have kind of uprooted our lives and our families. We are people of color, women of color coming into a very cold atmosphere. And it would be nice to know that there are spaces where we can go. And so I kind of translate that now into an investment in the humanity and wellness of these graduate students. Another practice that happened kind of more indirectly during my visit came from a different person. Um, during one of our kind of informal discussions after a reception, I was talking with another prospective student about my love for Toni Morrison and Sula in particular. And uh, one of the feminist scholars was listening and she kind of just made her way over and she got into the conversation and we struck up a talk. And I then learned like, oh, this is a hip hop scholar. This is the hip hop scholar <laughs> in the department. And so in a very kind of non-essentialist non way, that kind of informal moment where we could talk and kind of build conversation became so useful. That professor became my dissertation director, my mentor, my friend. And I appreciated that moment of her not making a direct beeline for me because graduate students get in our heads. We think, you know, one conversation with a professor and we're betrothed to them for the rest of our career. And so the kind of indirect way that she kind of let things happen organically, um, while also once I took her class, being able to articulate a vision, being able to say, I think you should apply for this conference. I'd like to read your abstract for this particular journal. Um, having a vision that showed that I was worth their time is a practice of what I'm calling formalized and somewhat informal short and long-term mentoring that I think does a lot to make graduate students of color feel at home. One of the last practices that I think can be done well is that there were a lot of faculty member that members in the department, not necessarily faculty members of color, that were able to talk about my research in a legible way. And so they could translate, they could intervene, they could amplify my work when it was not necessarily read in the um, framework of what is essential rhetoric and composition scholarship. And so I think for faculty members who see themselves as advocates, allies, whatever terminology you want to use for scholars of color, it is imperative that you do your homework, that you learn how to talk about the scholarship of these students in sophisticated and accurate ways. Because you may have to be the person amplifying their work or, inter or intervening for these students when they're not in the room. So these are things that I think could foster a hospitable environment. There are a couple of practices to avoid, and I will try to talk through these very quickly. Institutional silence and denial about a culture of racism on your campus is destructive. Um, I work at the University of Virginia. It's no, <laughs> it's no secret uh, what has happened in Charlottesville. I think if we were bringing students of color to campus and we were not kind of transparent and talking about the department stance, the university stance, we would be doing a deep disservice. Um, and so silence, that kind of silence, that kind of revisionist history denial is very destructive. Um, a second practice, instructor and curricular gatekeeping. When you have that professor who has possibly not done their research or doesn't have the esteem enough to really work with that student that might be in an area that's not their own, and yet they use language like, this is not actual communication study scholarship, or this is not true rhetorical scholarship. This is not real writing study scholarship. Who's doing work on speculative fiction in Black women in writing studies? I think that is perhaps one of the most violent and destructive practices that I've heard of people using. And so that's the kind of uh, disciplinary gatekeeping that actually pushes students out of a program. Instructor possessiveness versus passivity over graduate students is also dangerous. 
I don't think I have to really elaborate here. We know how students get claimed and how other faculty members take a hands-off approach. I think it needs to be an all, uh, all faculty on deck kind of approach if we really are invested in getting scholars of color uh, through the PhD. And lastly, this is one that I can talk more about in Q&A, but <laughs> I began actually with this bullet point first and worked backwards because it is a singular comment that has stayed with me in the decades since I finished my degree. I can remember encountering a faculty member who just casually said, oh, it's pretty much a fact that all African-American scholars get jobs. And I heard this in my third year as I was working on my comps. Now, this same faculty member did not acknowledge that at the same time, the whole job market was collapsing because it was 2008. They didn't acknowledge kind of the dearth or how few scholars of colors there, there actually are in the field. From their standpoint, I was gonna have like a free easy ride. And so it was not overt racism, but to me it spoke to a kind of passive aggressive racist myth and a set of discourses that circulate. I think that when these discourses get um, absorbed from other students, it's really destructive. I've had stories that get back to me of people saying like, oh, well, you know, Tamika's fine. All the black women in the program are deltas. And by that, I mean a particular uh, <laughs> sorority. But these are the kind of unspoken myths that left unchecked become really uh, destructive um, passive aggressive, they breed resentment among graduate students. And um, I think they're very dangerous. I'll stop here and uh, punt to Andre, but um, I'm eager to field questions in Q&A. Thank you. All right, and thank you. Um, and, and many of these things, I'm just gonna say cosign and, you know, and, and try to, um, not to repeat what's already being said. That's one of the things that we wanted to talk about. Uh, I did not, I think I just sent over a cover of, of the talk. So Karma, you don't have to um, put that up. I can just um, talk a little bit about what I wanted to share on today. And I want to start with where Tamika started and just talk about my own experience real briefly. Uh, I am, I mean, I, I, <laughs> When I share my story, I tell folks, I literally walked off the street. I didn't know anything about uh, a PhD in communication, didn't know anything about rhetoric. That I walked off the street, John Campbell, never forget it, um, um, set up an appointment and I'm coming into his office and I told him what I wanted to do or what I thought I could do. And um, John Campbell, I never forget it. He said, brother, I've been waiting on you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, um, because I had been at Memphis Theological Seminary. I just finished my uh, Master's of Divinity degree. And I'm just asking, can I enroll here with this MDiv? And he had been, and he shared with me basically, like, I've been going to that seminary and recruiting and, you know, each and every year with my cards and my my brochures and, and all of my wares, you know, if you know John Campbell, he's there. But, um, and I have never gotten a response. They, they, everybody's cordial, but nobody has showed up. And here I come off the street, literally into his office and saying, I want to do this. Um, make a long short story, we uh, started and uh, another person with me, Frank Thomas, that some of you might know, who's running a PhD program now in African-American preaching and sacred rhetoric at Christian Theological Seminary right now. Um, we were that part of my cohort. And, um, and back in 2008, we finished. Uh, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> Tamika, that was the year that, you know, where were the jobs, right? Um, but Memphis Theological, um, had a position uh, like a postdoc. I took that and as they say, the rest is history. I stayed there for seven years, um, had an opportunity to uh, really started to do work in rhetoric, race and religion, which I do 
um, currently now. And then uh, when the job opening came open at the University of Memphis back in the fall of 2015, um, I, at the last minute, um, sent in my application like at 11.48 p.m. <laughs> on the last day because I was still wondering, you know, do I want to, you know, give up the tenure here and go back? I mean, all of that stuff. And, and I finally decided to do that. And uh, I'll never forget the, the final interview. You know, you go to these interviews and um, I, I told them, I said, this is what I would like to do. Here's, because I knew my background, I knew the people I had been talking to, I knew the interest that was out there and all of that. They were making a promise to me and that's maybe one of the things that you, you when you are um, recruiting and when you're talking about faculty, especially when you make a commitment that you say, hey, we want this, we would like to have more African-American students. We in the city of Memphis is 70% black. I mean, went through all of those, urban university and your uh, position is African-American rhetoric. When you say that, I'm going to hold you to your words. And I'm going to say, this is what I am going to do. So basically, uh, when I started in the fall of 2015, um, we began um, with um, Tony DeVelasco, who was our um, director of graduate studies at the, um, at the time, began to, um, and this is the word that's going to keep coming back, intentionality, began to intentionally try to recruit students of color. But for the position that I was holding, I was focused on African-American students or people who are self-identify as Black. So um, when we began to do this type of work, um, the first thing that I wanted to do was to um, look at what has happened previously. I came out of the program. I knew Frank came out of the program. But what about anybody else? I wanted to go back. Because if you're trying to be intentional, you have to see what you have done, what you're doing now, and then what you hope to do in the future. So we went back and found that we actually had a foundation to work from. Um, for instance, um, Elitra, Elitra Gilchrist Petty now. Um, was the first African-American students to graduate in our PhD program at the University of Memphis back in 2004. Frank and I became the second and third. And up until that point, we've now have 14 um, African-American students who have graduated from the PhD. We don't know about MA yet. We're still trying to put those numbers together. MA program has been a little bit longer. But since 2000, we've graduated 14 African-American students in our PhD program which is, I mean, if you think about, I think we had 80 total. So that's roughly about 17.8% or whatever. Um, I didn't ask Craig Stewart to check my numbers. So y'all forgive me if, you know, um, not a quantitative scholar here. But, um, I, but I did take home theory. So I remember a little bit. But, but, <laughs> but um, so we had a foundation to build upon because right before uh, his untimely passing, Mike Leff, who was our um, chair at the time, began to, uh, began to work to institute an African-American um, rhetoric and especially African-American religious rhetoric uh, emphasis within the department. And of course, when he passed, that kind of, um, you know, passed with him. Um, but when I got there, I wanted to try to revive that. I said, okay, let's Let's work. I've been talking to people that are interested in doing something like that. Let's see if they be interested in doing a PhD, if they would be interested in doing um, a work here at the University of Memphis, so on and so forth. So we had this foundation. But, but um, the second thing, when we talk about um, um, the foundation, you just have to look at what it is that you're doing um, um, right now, I believe. So um, if you go to our website, in which we will share in the chat, our website, um, our um, Facebook and Twitter handles, and our current director of graduate studies, who is doing a terrific job, Dr. Marina Lebanon, uh, right now. If you go to our website, you will see that the total number of graduate students that we have, um, 
that are currently enrolled at the University of Memphis in the Department of Communication and Film. Um, the number is 53. Of that number, uh, 18 self-identify as black students, which is somewhere around 33.9, 34%. Um, now, since this is about rhetoric, what I did was I took those numbers and I said, well, what's the total number of grad students um, that are rhetoric uh, only? And I, and I wanted to just say rhetoric only because we have rhetoric and media studies and a couple of students are combining and doing, but just, just rhetoric and they're their main focus, at least their declared focus. And I did count the couple of students who are coming in fall of 2020 who said that that's their interest. Um, and we're looking at, uh, roughly about 18, but of that number, 12 self-identify as African-American or Black. So 66% of our rhetoric students self-identify um, uh, as, um, our rhetoric students self-identify as African-American. I already told you about the graduation, but one of the things that we are really pleased with is this whole notion of um, what we are doing now as it relates to recruitment, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but now our fall 2020 class, uh, we had 13 students that make up the fall 2020 cohort, six identify as African-American, um, and that's roughly what, 46 some odd percent. So, and that has been steadily increasing. So what brought all of this on? I'm, and, and basically it's being intentional. We, um, and, you know, we sat down and said, this is what we want to try to do. We wanted to be intentional about um, bringing in uh, um, students of color. Now, if we have, we've broadened this scope, those numbers will go up a little bit. But uh, my main focus on this presentation have just been African-American students. So, so what, what, what did we do? What I talk, when I talk about intentionality, what does that mean? And Tamika uh, um, said it um, already, but the whole notion about recruitment, you know, how are we recruiting students? Are you even talking to students of color? Are you having conversations with them? You know, I mean, if you really want, are you talking with uh, HBCU um, um, graduates? Are you talk? Do you know where the students of color are? <laughs> you just like let's just go and let's show up there if people are calling you do you really get involved in their stories and what they want to uh, research and what they want to work and 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 then talk about um, someone on your faculty that can probably work with them i mean the recruitment process is ongoing it just doesn't happen at nca or rsa or the four c's doing the recruitment fair it is ongoing. That's what I found out. It is always ongoing. Secondly, um, support. That, that is very, very important as well, too, um, as it relates to uh, once students come, Tamika was sharing her uh, experience. My experience was um, something similar. Um, I did not have, um, um, no, no, let me see. No. I did, in rhetoric proper, we did not have uh, any African American uh, professors. However, uh, Mike Leff, who was my chair, supported me wholeheartedly in my project and um, saw value in it, encouraged, support, all of that, introduced me to people and, 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 and all. And so I felt like I was affirmed. I had a great, wonderful. Um, graduate experience. And one of the things that I try to do with students now is to affirm them, um, you know, uh, support them, not only in the institution, but outside of the institution as well, you know, and even in social media, you know, if they're doing something uh, outside of, you know, scholarship or outside of the academy, I want to support that uh, as well. And then lastly, of course, um, and I think this is very, very important, is to celebrate. Um, celebrate publications, celebrate um, 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 top paper awards, celebrate any and every time you get, celebrate multiple times, celebrate the R&R, &R, then celebrate the publication, and then celebrate the award on the publication. I mean, 
celebrate, celebrate, and, and affirm this. Now, why do you do this? And you do it publicly. You just don't do it through the email. Um, that's the start. You get that and you, you know, everybody gets the email. Uh, I think every, every um, department has that. But social media, you go out and when you're talking to other students, invoke their names. And, 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 and talk about, you know, now we're building up a, a, a um, foundation, building on a foundation where we can name some folk. Hey, so-and-so went to this program. So-and-so did this. That sounds like a project that so-and-so just was doing. You ought to call so-and-so. Yeah, I mean, those are the type of things that I think really um, not only um, make students, you know, so feel supported and affirmed and all of that, but it also makes them talk about your program in positive ways. So when they go out and when they are talking to other students, you know, you can just sit back and just say, the, the student, you need to talk to the grad. They will give you the graduate side of this stuff. And, and so um, we don't claim to have it all together. We still have our issues. We're working on uh, faculty now, and we're still doing, um, and we're wanting to have more uh, faculty of color, uh, for instance. Uh, we are revamping another thing that is uh, important uh, in the recruitment and support is to have a catalog that looks like you're doing stuff um, that would be attractive to students of color. You know, uh, everything just can't be seminar and rhetoric. You know, you, you know, what what is that seminar? What have you taught in the past that I might be interested in doing? So uh, we're working on all of that. But um, start, we are trying to build on the legacy that was created before even I got here and um, created for, um, from people who really affirm and believe um, that um, students that may not be the typical MA to PhD or just typical grad students. Uh, and I can talk about that during the Q&A because part of the recruiting is also looking outside of the academy and outside of what we traditionally think would make a good rhetoric scholar, uh, you'll be surprised on who you will find. Uh, um, uh, but we can talk about that in the Q and A. But when we, what we are trying to do is build upon that and, and to continue to build. And I think momentum has already started, and um, um, I'm excited to uh, be a part of the University of Memphis and the Department of Communication and Film. And I just want to uh, again just shout out all of my colleagues and people who are working tirelessly to try to rectify a, a whole lot of stuff that we always talk about, but also now being intentional about it. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Tamika. Uh, lots of wisdom there for folks. Uh, I'm gonna just spend just a couple of minutes running through a couple of points I wanted to raise. And um, you know, while I'm doing so, if folks want to start adding uh, questions, uh, so we can be looking at them on our end, uh, and uh, then I'll start facilitating that. You should be able to post your questions anonymously. If you can't for some reason, and you want to ask an anonymous question, you can send it to me uh, privately, and I won't say your name. So, but I think you can post it anonymously. But I'm gonna um, just. Uh, share my screen here and talk through just a couple things real quick. All right. So I, you know, I'm so appreciative of my colleagues and really uh, want to just add a few things that are um, maybe a, uh, slightly different. They'll build absolutely on what they're saying. Um, one of the things I wanted to, to start with, this is something that uh, comes up a lot, which is um, one of the ways that we kind of approach the recruitment of students of color is, oh, we've got to do you know, all these things to support them, which of course is true with all students and students of color. But um, I think it's really important to recognize that we learn a lot uh, about students and their applications and that all of the things they bring are not deficits, they're assets. And so the fact that this is a first-gen student 
the fact that this student went to community college first, the fact that their parents were like mine, you know, a welder and a lunch lady, like those are assets. They're going to contribute to your program and to actually think of it in that way and find ways to use those assets. The other thing that I, I, I think I see a lot is there's a way in which predominantly white programs, um, they all of a sudden, I guess, learned it's important to bring in students of color. And so there's a kind of expectation then that bringing those students of color in is going to do the work of diversifying the department. Um, this can happen with junior faculty too, but with grad students. And, and I think we have to be really clear that we don't dump the work of diversifying our departments on the newest and least empowered members of those departments. Uh, doing diversity work is hard work. It's not fun work and there's a lot of backlash. And so you can't rely on those students to do that work for you. Rather, you need to be ready um, to bring those students in. And so what does it mean to be ready? Uh, I think a big thing is to diversify all the syllabi, as many of them as you can. There's always going to be people who won't diversify their syllabus, but for the most part, you want to get them diversified specifically in terms of race, gender, sexuality, also in terms of transnational content, disability. These issues are crucially important. Students of color don't necessarily come in to study race, right? They study all sorts of things, but everybody wants to see themselves reflected in the syllabus. And so a big way to show that you're serious about this is to diversify your syllabus. Should go without saying you need to hire faculty of color. Uh, and if you are on a hiring freeze and you can't hire those faculty of color, well, you better build some good relationships with faculty of color around campus. And then you better figure out a way to compensate them for the labor that you might ask them to do to support your students of color. It's always important to um, compensate folks in that way. But really, I, I, if you can bring faculty of color in, bring them in. That will help with your recruitment and retention efforts. Of course, you have to support them in the same way and don't dump that diversity work on them either. A couple other things just to mention here um, that may not immediately come to mind uh, when you're thinking about this, but it's one of the ways to be ready is to foster a professional department culture where there are clear boundaries between grads and faculty. And I've been terrible at this over the years, sort of lots of socializing, you know, come from departments with a big culture of socializing. But this is actually can be a big problem for students of color who then feel obligated to have to socialize with their older white faculty in order to get the mentorship they need. So it's just best to keep those boundaries clear and not put students in that awkward situation. Relatedly, it's important to foster a department culture premised in accountability to racial and gender justice, which means that if you have a problematic faculty member in your department, there's no excuses to be made. Oh, he's just old. Oh, he's always been this way. Oh, he's never gonna change. To be blunt, that's all bullshit. You need to confront it directly and you need to make sure there's a way for it to either stop or to be completely isolated so that you're not subjecting already vulnerable people to potential harm. So you just have to deal with those folks. It's not fun, but it's what you have to do if you want students of color. Next thing I just wanna say real quick is, uh, if you can't see color, you don't see racism. I get that liberalism tells us that we should be colorblind, uh, you're not colorblind, nobody is, and rest assured, any student of color you bring into your department, they see how white the department is. It is not news to them. They absolutely know that it's the case. And so you need to recognize that racism exists. Race is an important way that we make sense of the world we live in. And this speaks to the point that uh, Tamika made about when she was recruited and she was brought out into the community and could all of a sudden see the life outside of school. Absolutely finding ways to, whether it's connecting students with the Black Graduate Student Association or uh, organizations in the community, or you know, if, if you have a Muslim student coming in, letting them know where the halal grocery store is in town. Um, these are all ways that you can show that you see and value culture and you wanna provide support that you may not be able to personally provide, but you can provide resource and access. Last thing I wanna say before we turn to question and answer is that you have to invest in students of color. And what I mean by this is that a number of your universities have uh, diversity fellowships of some sort. And these diversity fellowships 
uh, are great for recruiting, right? Because student of color uh, can come in on the diversity fellowship, affirmative action fellowship, get a big pot of money uh, that first, maybe that second year. And it's often viewed as a freebie for the department because, wow, we get to bring this student of color in, in addition to the white students that we really want to bring in. And what I want to say is don't do that. Now, that doesn't mean don't give them the fellowship. Give them the fellowship. But it's vitally important that the department also invest in the students so that it's not a freebie, so that you're saying you're going to get this fellowship and we're going to top up that fellowship. And when that fellowship doesn't exist, here's all the resources the department is going to give you. That is both materially and symbolically important because where your funding comes from, that speaks to you as a student of color. And you know, if you're the student who gets that, you think, oh, of course, I, you know, they, they brought me in on that fellowship. But if you got that fellowship and a lot of departmental support, that will speak volumes about how much the department actually values uh, students of color. So those are just a few things that I was thinking of um, as we were uh, getting prepped up for this. And so I think um, now looks like we got a lot going on here in the, <laughs> in the answer. Uh, and so uh, I am gonna kind of just go through these here. Um, and some of them might have a little crossover, uh, but um, I think Andre, you addressed this a little bit, but if there are uh -huh. any more pieces of advice you have or practices for identifying potential students of color for MA or PhD program. Right, yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that, um, that we had talked about, we have not uh, launched it yet, um, formally, informally we have, um, is, is what I mentioned earlier about HBCUs and HBCU graduates. If you are um, looking um, to reach more African-American uh, um, students. Also, again, outside of, in the community, outside of the community, the black church is full of um, um, potential um, um, students if, if that's you know, where you wanna go. Other places, um, community centers. Uh, I, I love what you just said, Tamika, about, you know, Banks' program. Um, those are programs all that are different and in different cities all the time. Um, and, and people um, are looking, and you'll be surprised on how many people are interested in coming back to school and wanting to go to school or finish school, um, even if it's an undergrad degree, and then they um, stay around for MA. Um, you know, those are the type of things that, that you know, that's kind of like outside the box or anything like that. And also another thing that I have done is, you know, I've opened myself up and I make myself available to try to talk to anyone, to give out the basic information the best that I can, um, um, places that I go, um, what people see that I, what I do, they ask me about what I do, how I do it. Uh, I share that, and um, and we begin to have a conversation. Um, some of the students that are in our program right now, um, myself and other faculty members, talked to them first three years ago, um, and now they've you know decided that this is the program for them. So uh, those are the type of things that I'm talking about: just being available, just being open, and not looking. I love what you said, Carmen, about not looking at the life history and story as deficits, but as pluses, just like, hey, I would be excited to have you into this program. And let's see what we can do to make that happen. Um, I'll jump in here and mm -hmm. also say that um, this is something that I've had cause to think about recently. It's just been the trajectory of my career that even though I'm cultural rhetorics, I end up in places where I'm the first person doing this thing. And so my graduate students don't look like me per se you know uh, i'm just now to the point where we are recruiting and, and at uva we recruited five black women into our phd this year and so i'm excited about that but i also have all of my students whose content won't look anything like what i do but i am kind of self-sufficient enough in who i am as a scholar and as a teacher that my students don't have to look like me they are rigorous thinkers, they have methods. And so in that way, I can build those relationships. I think when well-intentioned faculty 
developed this kind of like, oh, well, I'm also, I'm not an African Americanist. I'm not a Latinx scholar. So there's nothing I can give you. That creates the isolation and almost abandonment that also push students outside of the program. And so I think it's on us as faculty to stay widely read so that we can recognize, you know, those gems in the rough who may not look like, you know, what we would see in the discipline just yet, but also to kind of hone our methods and know who we are as instructors so that we can bring the best part of what we teach to these students. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, unsurprisingly, we were at 10 minutes left and we've got uh, a pile of questions. So uh, we, might have to see, we might have to see, we'll get through as much as we can. <laughs> Uh, we'll see if we can uh, think of some way to, to, to have some of these questions answered. So um, someone asks, uh, this, is, this is a hard question, but I think it's worth putting out there. What should graduate students of color look for and expect of an advisor, especially when there are little to no faculty of color in the department? Hmm. Thoughts, Andre? Or Tamika, you uh, want to go first? Yeah, re real quick. I mean, um... One of the things I, I like to do is to um, have a meeting and try to get to know the person, try to get to know the person uh, for real. You know, let's open up, let's just talk, let's dialogue, let's see, um, let me hear what it is that you're interested in. Let me hear what you uh, want to do. Um, and let me see what I can do to best support that. Um, and that, and a lot of times that means more listening, more conversation. Um, so that's one of the things. And um, you need to be, I think students need to feel comfortable uh, with their professors. And I think professors need to be comfortable with students and all students, whether it is your, it, whether you are the dissertation chair or that's your student, or if you are just part of the faculty and you see the student, you know, every now and then in the hallways. Um, you have to be, the place needs to be inviting and comfortable and people need to want to show up. So I stopped there, but I, yeah, that's, that's something that really, that I could, um, kind of weigh in on. I would say that, um, a faculty member, if they have a vision for, um, the full kind of career and life of the graduate student. Like I said, I may not, you know, I've worked with students doing things in food studies. That is not my area, but I knew how to figure out ways for that student to kind of deepen their intellectual practice, to uh, pursue fellowships, things like that. I think one thing that a lot of uh, graduate students of color resent is the entire curriculum that is withheld from them by certain professors in the program. I can remember discovering like, oh, I didn't know that I should be doing X. Oh, well, this professor told his students that, and <laughs> you know, it's not translating like programmatically. And again, I don't say this to suggest that, you know, you don't save some of your best information for your own, but if I were back in that graduate student model, I would want to know who has a plan for what you know, how to get out of this program, what kind of uh, jobs I should be looking for, where I should be trying to publish, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you said the, the, the vision word. The vision word is just so, oh my God, yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, because <laughs> as I said, I came out of an MA program. No one was talking to me about how to pursue a PhD. Then I show up at visiting days and someone else from that same MA program is sitting in the room. And so the conversation had been happening somewhere. Wow. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That's, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. Um, I'm going to uh, throw another question out here. Um, so this person says, uh, as, as a white person, mm -hmm. what is the best way to approach the topic of mentoring, finding communities of support with students, faculty of color? They say, I, I want to both recognize that individuals might want additional different kinds of support, but I don't want to assume someone wants this help because of their identity. Is this always a welcome topic of discussion? I think this is great. It's kind of the inverse of the question we just had. Right, right, right. I don't know. Tamika, do you want to, do you have thoughts on that first? I do, because I've had, um, 
I've encountered these very well-intentioned white faculty members early in my program. And I think, it, I, I think they were able to signal to me, right? Like, oh, it's clear that you're gonna probably be working with this set of faculty, but I'm available. Like, this is my open door policy. And it came from a very kind of social perspective. You know, I was invited to lunch. I was invited out to decorate cookies or something like that. And I would go. And those professors always signaled to me that they would be there if I needed them. And so even that was uh, comforting to me. I wonder if it's worth uh, some of the, the colleagues that are on this call to think about like how you can just signal that you're available. Mm -hmm. uh, open door if that I, I know it seems cliche but I think it's actually a really helpful practice and no I, 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 I will uh, totally agree with that but can I also say that there are, there is some risk involved in this you may not get it right yeah I, 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 you know I, I hear that question a lot and it's like you know maybe yeah there are some risk involved but but, but one of the safest ways, even doing it safe, is just to say, hey, I'm available, I'm open, and then follow through when the student does show up and, and ask for counsel and advice. Um, and so, um, yeah, but, but just realize that, you know, um, stuff may happen and stuff may be misinterpreted or said wrongly or, or said in a way that it, um, wrong that you might have to bag back on and stuff. So yes, that, that, that may happen, but we cannot not attempt to do it. So mm -hmm. just want to throw that out as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think we all have to be willing to make mistakes. And I mean, I think we're even learning that uh, right. in like among communities of color, right? I mean, we've been yeah. as, you know, I think Latino communities in the midst of this moment of, of rebellion and struggle for black lives, realizing how deeply embedded anti-Black racism is in Latinx communities, right? <laughs> so it's not just a white faculty person of color. Right. It's like, you know, exactly. we're all dealing with these things and we have to be willing to make mistakes, um, but to try anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So. And, and, but that goes back again to the inviting culture to have to allow for those, I mean, if, if the culture is already toxic, then any little mistake is gonna be magnified, right? But if, if, if you are trying to promote a healthy culture in the beginning, um, maybe you can sit down and talk and get an understanding like, oh, okay, uh, I didn't hear it that way, but you know, I take you for your word, let's go, let's move, and you know, we're gonna keep on working, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna throw this, this is a very, very timely question that I, I wanna throw uh, to you. So. This moment, COVID moment, we're all virtual. Departments are being asked to do recruitment through little video ads. But so many of the issues we're talking about here require much more than a little video approved by university marketing. So how do we reconcile the difficulty of recruiting without personal in-person connection with this need to market ourselves, especially in this moment? Seems like Andre has something to no, share. No, 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 I, I, I think it's a great moment, but go ahead. <laughs> no, I, you know, we just finished our recruitment window like three huh? days before our, our campus shut down. Uh, and so, <laughs> I was, I was punting back to you, Andre. Oh, no, no. I, okay, just off the top of my head, I think this is a, um, a golden opportunity to do some recruiting. What we're doing now is recruiting. What? What your department can do is recruiting. Um, um, when your new books come out, you can do Zoom now and talk about your research. You can reach more people than you probably would reach if you just invited them to a luncheon, for instance, in person. Uh, I think that if you, I mean, the sky's the limit, I think it, it is time for us to become real creative with our social media, with our um, uh, media more broadly, uh, our podcast, all of that. I mean, we we can talk about specific issues that are germane to the current climate that is going on right now. Um, so I I, I, just, I I think that we could do a whole lot um, um, outside of the single you know video and 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 things of that nature 
but let's let's just talk about what does it mean to be in rhetoric proper and just have that going on and on. I, and and um, um, I think that people will reach out and want to talk a little bit more. Hey, I was interested in what you were doing. Um, and that's one of the things, though, that some of us have an issue with. And, you know, talking about what we do and what we write and how we do it and all of that. But, you know, um, maybe get somebody else on the faculty to help you and just promote, you know, some of the stuff that you do. Because this is what people are interested in. And if it's something that you're doing that, you know, I got an interest in, yeah, I want to come to, to that school and, and, and work with that person or work with those people because they seem like they're inviting and caring. And um, I think I can do what it is that I feel like I need to do. So mm -hmm. I just think it's a great, I, I think we need to open, just reimagine what it means to recruit. And I mean, what it means to promote our own departments and and do these recruiting type of um, thingies that we do. Yeah, yeah. So we are, it's actually three o'clock. I don't wanna cut you off to make if you have something you wanna say yeah. in response to that. But I do wanna be really respectful uh, of everybody's time. Uh, I'm, I, uh, I'm not gonna put more work on Andre and Tamika, but I, I am gonna collect uh, the questions that didn't get answered. Uh, mm -hmm. And if, if I have anything to say, if, if they wanna say anything about it, I, they are very, very busy people, but um, I'll try and find a way to get some of those uh, additional answers uh, put in some form out. I'll talk to the folks at RSA. Um, so I apologize if we didn't get all your questions answered, but I really hope that uh, you learned something from this. And I'm so deeply grateful to uh, Andre and Tamika for joining me on this. I wish we could have done it over a couple of days, um, mm -hmm. but this was, this was good. I know I learned a lot from you both. And uh, I just wanted to uh, once again thank our sponsors uh, from the University of Illinois, the Writing Studies uh, and Department of Communication. Uh, and I also want to remind you that we'll have another RSA remote event two weeks from today on September 4th. And so keep an eye out on the Facebook and your email because more information uh, will be coming. So uh, again, thank you, Andre. Thank you, Tamika. Thank um, you. And, thank you, uh, Tama, for setting this up and, um, and allowing me an opportunity to participate. Always love to hear from both of you. <laughs> so, all right, everybody. Thanks so right, much. Tamika. Happy new academic year. Yes. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye.